and you, you know how to use the clicker also. So thank you, Dr. Duvet and Dr. Sosi for having me. And can, you, can everyone hear me? Am I loud enough in the back? Well, I'll speak up a little bit more, but thank you also, Alex, for your both eloquent and very comprehensive talk. And I think you and I will take different approaches to this broader topic of neuroscience and, and pet imaging. And I should mention that my own research interest has, has two different halves. One half is in using uh, pet tracers to explore the pathogenesis of neurodegenerative disorders. And I'm not going to be talking about that today. I'm going to be talking about a separate uh, uh, element of, of pet in clinical medicine that's also near and dear to my heart, uh, but that has more controversy surrounding it. And that's how do we employ pet and spect in clinical medicine uh, for neurodegenerative disorders. So uh, first, I have no uh, relevant disclosures, but I have current funding from the American Academy of Neurology. And so this is going to be kind of an outline of what I'll speak about today. So I'll talk uh, at first a little bit about dopamine transporter imaging and movement disorders, but I'll spend the greater part of the talk talking about dementias and the use of FDG PET and amyloid imaging uh, in the clinical management of dementias. So I have some regulatory disclosures as well, which are particularly relevant to uh, uh, American members of our audience. So, so FDG PET is approved for brain imaging and, and is specifically reversed, uh, reimbursed by Centers for Medicare Services, or CMS, which is an abbreviation I'll use a lot, uh, only for the distinction of frontotemporal dementia from Alzheimer's disease. DAT scanning, or FPSIT, is also approved uh, both by the FDA and by CMS, but only for distinguishing a Parkinsonian syndrome from an atypical tremor, such as essential tremor, and not for the evaluation of dementia. Floor beta peer is FDA approved, is an amyloid tracer and is FDA approved, but is only reimbursed by CMS for this very restricted uh, subset of patients receiving scans as part of a research study aimed at validating amyloid PET imaging for dementia. And I should mention, if anyone has any questions throughout the talk, please raise your hand and, and uh, I'd be happy to be interrupted. So uh, my clinical practice is largely uh, spent seeing patients with movement disorders and patients with uh, dementias, both of which can fall under the broader heading of neurodegenerative disorders. So the most common movement disorder is essential tremor. Uh, but the most talked about movement disorders is idiopathic Parkinson's disease or just Parkinson's disease. Uh, there are several uh, cousins of Parkinson's disease, I say, uh, that are, we call atypical Parkinsonian disorders, but that are also characterized by loss of uh, nigral cells and afferent axons to the striatum. And those include progressive supranuclear palsy, multiple systems atrophy. There's a type P, which is a more Parkinsonian clinical phenotype, and a type C, which is a more cerebellar phenotype. And cortical basal ganglionic degeneration, uh, which is actually called cortical basal syndrome during life. Um, there are several movement disorders that are characterized by not having nigrostriatal neurodegeneration, and those include essential tremor and dystonic tremor. Uh, isolated rest tremor and drug-induced Parkinsonism are both Parkinsonian conditions that can have variable nigrostriatal uh, degeneration. So I'm going to talk briefly about three different tracer approaches for imaging uh, dopamine terminals within the, uh, within the striatum. And the first is fluoridopa. So fluoridopa is an F18 labeled version of the most commonly used medication to treat Parkinsonian conditions, L-dopa. Fluoridopa is converted into fluoridopamine by amino acid decarboxylase or dopa decarboxylase. Uh, this enzyme's activity is actually regulated by D2 receptors, and so can be upregulated or downregulated in, in conditions of medication exposure. It's not thought to have an age-related decline uh, over time. A second imaging method that's perhaps the most commonly used clinically and the most commercially available for clinical medicine is FPSIT, which binds to the dopamine transporter on the presynaptic membrane uh, and binds to uh, cocaine analogs uh, in, in PET and SPECT imaging. So this is a scan of an individual on the left uh, showing an asymmetric loss of putaminal terminals uh, that's worse two years later, consistent with Parkinsonism. So DAT binding uh, is specific to dopamine terminals within the striatum, um, but uh, ligands also bind to serotonergic and noradrenergic uh, terminals 
outside of the striatum. Uh, DAT binds to cocaine analogs when on the presynaptic membrane, but can be recycled uh, and in those situations does not, uh, is not actively bind, binding to PET ligands. The third is a, is a ligand that we use commonly at Michigan, but that's less um, commercially used, which is a um, carbon-11 labeled DTPZ, which binds to the VMAT2 or vesicular monoamine transporter type 2 uh, receptor on uh, vesicles containing dopamine in the presynaptic neurons. VMAT2 imaging is thought to decline normal, uh, normally as part of normal aging over time. So this slide here shows a 30-year-old individual, a 70-year-old individual who shows slightly lower VMAT2 binding throughout the caudate and putamen, and then an individual with Parkinson's disease with more marked loss of dopamine terminals. So this was a study conducted by our group that involved looking at 70, uh, 71 normal controls and 30 individuals with Parkinson's disease. The normal controls are marked by a circle, and uh, men are marked by a black dot, women by a, a open dot. Parkinson's disease individuals are seen below and are labeled with squares. And you can see that there's roughly a 0.5% per year of life loss of uh, DTPZ binding uh, in the striatum over time, but that individuals with Parkinson's disease seem to form a completely separate and completely more profound subset of, of, uh, of dopamine terminal loss compared to even older individuals uh, without Parkinson's disease. So VMAT2 expression is not specific to dopamine terminals in general, but within the striatum, 95% of VMAT2 expression is in dopaminergic neurons and hence is making it a uh, good target for assessing dopamine, dopamine terminal integrity. There's also a dogma in uh, Parkinson's disease science that VMAT2 expression is not readily regulated by dopaminergic medications. Uh, this is somewhat poorly substantiated in the literature, but the dogma is still carried through with us today. So each of these imaging methods are, are uh, effective at distinguishing clinically relevant Parkinsonism from the alternative. And the reason for that is, is all of our Parkinsonian conditions are characterized not by subtle, but by severe loss of dopamine terminals at the time of clinical expression of motor Parkinsonism. Uh, and so that's greater than 50% losses of dopamine terminals within the uh, posterior putamen. Uh, making each of these valid approaches to uh, categorizing patients as Parkinsonian or not. Uh, the potential clinical uses that have been well studied are differentiating a Parkinsonian tremor from uh, an alternative cause of tremor. So this is, a, this is a study that was conducted in Spain in a movement disorders neurology clinic that looked at 118 individuals with what they called clinically uncertain Parkinsonian syndromes, all of whom underwent that spec imaging. They all had uh, clinical exams and clinical diagnoses given prior to dat spec imaging. And what the investigators found was that in 36% of indivi individuals who were thought to have non-Parkinsonian conditions, positive dat spec imaging was found that changed their, their underlying impression. And the opposite was also true. 54% of individuals thought to be non-Parkinsonian baseline had negative, uh, I'm sorry, thought to be Parkinsonian baseline had negative dat spec imaging, suggesting normal dopamine terminal integrity. Overall imaging led to changes in clinical management in 72% of cases. And you can see from this table or this histogram up here that roughly 50% of that, uh, of those changes in clinical management were either to initiate or stop uh, certain medications. And so I just want to spend a second here talking about clinically uncertain Parkinsonian syndromes because utilization of this particular uh, technology, DAT scanning, is, is somewhat controversial within neurology. Uh, the thought is that it may represent a, um, an unnecessary test in certain individuals uh, where we could come up with similar information by giving them a trial of dopaminergic medications. The, the, the conundrum, though, is that, is that I think that that spec is particularly useful in this subset of patients, in patients with clinically uncertain Parkinsonian syndromes. But that, that four-word term is really a term that suggests that the patient has already been seen by uh, a subspecialist, because that's not typically uh, a term that's, that's given to a patient uh, who's assessed by their primary care physician or even by a general neurologist less experienced at seeing Parkinsonian uh, patients. So certain investigators have come up with this algorithm about how best to employ DAT-SPECT in clinical practice. 
And it really has three main branches. Um, and the branch here off, off to the left uh, suggests that if you see a patient who has uh, Parkinsonism and they fulfill what's called the UK Parkinson's disease brain bank clinical criteria for Parkinson's disease, the most appropriate thing is, is to diagnose them with Parkinson's disease, give them medications for Parkinson's disease, and if they show a poor therapeutic response, then consider a DAT scan. DAT scan. The alternative uh, other side of the coin is for individuals who clearly do not uh, show evidence of idiopathic Parkinson's disease and whose underlying diagnosis is thought to be something else, there's no need to proceed with the DAT scan. These CUPS patients or clinically uncertain Parkinsonian syndrome patients, however, might be especially well managed with a DAT scan since this will give us very definitive prognostic information in what is otherwise a world of uncertainty. So in summary, uh, dopamine PET imaging uh, is useful in the management and useful in the workup of patients with clinically uncertain Parkinsonian syndromes. Uh, dopamine uh, SPECT imaging is FDA approved for assisting with the distinction of a tremulous condition compared to a dopamine deficiency disorder. It may be very useful in the management of CUPS patients, but it does not appear to distinguish between certain dopamine deficiency disorders. Namely, it's not effective at distinguishing between atypical Parkinsonian disorders and garden variety Parkinson's disease. So I'm going to spend the rest of the talk talking about, uh, talking about dementias. And what I'd like to do first is actually provide a little bit of a background about the um, public health problem that dementias represent, because I think it gives us some perspective for how and where PET imaging uh, can fit into this, uh, into this picture and, and improve public health for individuals with dementia. So dementia is an incredibly common and incredibly morbid uh, disease. Roughly one in eight individuals over the age of 65 suffer from dementia. Over 5 million individuals in the United States are currently estimated to have dementia, and that number is expected to increase to 8 million by 2030. Dementia itself is just a, is a description of a disability. It's not a description of a specific disease process. Uh, the most common cause of dementias are neurodegenerative diseases, and the most common of those is Alzheimer's disease, followed by vascular dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies, and less commonly frontotemporal dementia. So dementias in the United States represent an enormous uh, cost to society. Uh, a study this year suggested that um, in the U.S. alone, uh, dementias might equate to roughly $200 billion in expenditures per year. Uh, and startlingly, about 75% of this cost is for uh, care-related services, either at home or in institutional long-term care. Actually, a fraction of this, this particular calculation, of this cost calculation, uh, is ascribed to lost wages on the part of caregivers taking care of family members who have dementia. If we factor that out, the number drops to about 110 million. That 110 million, though, is still more than uh, comparable uh, common chronic diseases like cancer or heart disease, both of which are slightly under 100 billion per year. So this is, a, this is an astronomical uh, public health problem. And what that 75% number means to me is that if we are able to make even minor improvements uh, through medic medical management in, in a f ADL or activities of daily living or functional related disability amongst patients with neurodegenerative dementias, it has the potential for substantial societal cost savings. So uh, this slide is aimed basically to give an overview of why we don't have a treatment for dementias. And I think that uh, each, with each of these points, uh, one can construe an argument for how PET and SPECT imaging might help us get from point A to point B. So the first and the biggest reason is that it's just very difficult to test uh, preclinical therapies for, de for dementing disorders in animal models and not in, in human models. These are subtle neurodegenerative phenotypes that may have specific, uh, that may reflect the specific characterization of the human nervous system. And um, we need more preclinical research to better understand why people develop neurodegenerative dementias how they progress, and what uh, treatments might be effective. Um, and PET imaging is part of that, uh, uh, part of that work. The other is that there, uh, there's a long, insidious, and often heterogeneous disease course that characterizes most dementias. And I would say that this distinguishes dementing disorders from other public health challenges that have met uh, uh, or that have, that have seen advancements in their treatments in the last generation, including 
things like HIV and heart disease. Uh, often people who develop dementias later in life can have an antecedent course that lasts for years and sometimes decades and sometimes multiple decades uh, where it's very difficult to identify these individuals and this is the time probably when individuals need to be enrolled in experimental therapeutic trials. Since, each, since dementias increase in prevalence with advancing age, the, another problem we run into is that there's an overlap of neurodegenerative pathologies because each of these become more common with, with advancing age. Um, these days, 50% of individuals who are diagnosed with dementia and who undergo postmortem evaluations have more than one type of neurodegenerative pathology, suggesting that that reduces uh, the efficacy of, uh, of potential therapeutics if these individuals were to be enrolled in clinical trials during life. Uh, this is the big one where PET imaging would come in, uh, or where molecular imaging is, is useful, is that clinical markers of disease progression are incredibly imprecise and lead to the failure of many clinical trials in, in dementias. And because of all of these reasons, there's a substantial cost to developing and testing any hypothesized therapy uh, for neurodegenerative dementias. Just to hit this point home one more time, um, this cost uh, is shared by everybody in science. This cost uh, uh, is, is, a, is manifest as a direct cost to uh, funding sources, whether they're in industry or federal or foundation funding sources. It's also a cost uh, that's, that's borne out in, a, uh, in the use of a limited number of participants for clinical trials for neurodegenerative dementias. Because while dementias are common and while neurodegenerative uh, disorders are common, the aim of all these studies, of all clinical trial studies, is to enroll individuals with very mild disease uh, who might have the best chance of demonstrating uh, a clinically meaningful efficacy for an experimental treatment. And that's a much smaller number. Uh, and that's not an infinite, uh, infinite uh, population of individuals in, in, any, in, in the world. And the third is, is uh, more of my subjective feeling is that for each failed trial in neurodegenerative disorders, uh, there's a temporary setback that's suffered in the court of public opinion that can temporarily affect uh, funding sources, subject participation, and industry priorities for preclinical drug development. So what is dementia? I mentioned that it's, it's a description of a, of a disability, but not of a specific disorder. So this is the, this is the dsm 4 which is sort of our clinical diagnostic manual. This is the definition of dementia. Um, and it's not, this is not a terribly profound definition, but this is, this is the definition that exists. So memory impairment is a core feature. At least one of the following other cognitive disabilities, aphasia, apraxia, agnosia, or disturbances in executive functioning. Uh, cognitive impairments have to be severe enough to cause some loss of uh, life function. Uh, the decline must represent a decline from a previous higher level of functioning. And finally, um, the diagnosis cannot be made in the setting of an acute cognitive change that might be due to an infection or metabolic derangements or medication side effects. So why is making the diagnosis of dementia important from a public health perspective? Well, one is that it helps families uh, plan and consider about what to do going forward uh, for, for the rest of their life, not only families but patients themselves. Uh, the second is that it can obviate the need for additional diagnostic tests and ineffective and potential harm, potentially harmful treatments as well. Uh, the third is that it might be able to reduce, on a broader uh, sense, healthcare resource utilization uh, by directing appropriate symptomatic medical management and behavioral interventions to the right parties. And the fourth point is that um, by diagnosing dementia accurately, we can enhance the enrollment of individuals or enrich the enrollment of, of individuals in clinical trials, uh, which has the microscopic uh, chance of helping an individual themselves, but the more macroscopic uh, goal of, Im of improving therapies for dementias, which clearly would improve public health. So, uh, so I mentioned that the, the uh, clinically uncertain Parkinsonian syndrome uh, term is, is best deployed by a movement disorders physician, and that dementias are a very common disorder. So I think one question that, that uh, the imaging field needs to ask is, if we're positioning imaging tests as a useful diagnostic tool for detecting dementia, who is it that would be ordering these tests in the first place? And, and you know, is it useful for them to order these tests? Um, so we conducted a, a retrospective study of a nationally representative sample of individuals over the age of 70, of about 850 individuals. Uh, 
uh, and at all of whom underwent detailed neuropsychological testing. And we found that 308 of those individuals met neuropsychological testing criteria for dementia. And roughly half of those individuals with dementia had actually been seen by a physician outside the context of our study for, for cognitive concerns. So, so that's, an, I mean, that's an interesting finding in and of itself. Uh, another question, though, is if they did see a physician, who, which, what kind of physician did they see? And this information was provided both by the patients and by their uh, caregiver or informant. Uh, and it looks like about 58 percent, so almost, almost 60 percent of individuals are being evaluated for dementia, not by specialists who have experience in, in parsing the subtleties of cognitive difficulties, but by their primary care physicians. And I think that that's an important consideration when, when trying to understand uh, who will be, who utilizes PET imaging. And you can see that there's a breakdown down here of um, what did the doctor say was the cause of memory trouble, and with about 28% saying dementia and 28% saying Alzheimer's disease, those were the leading causes, and that seems appropriate. So what does that clinical evaluation typically consist of? And I can, I can tell you in my own practice, this is what it typically consists of. So a history provided by the patient or informant, um, a brief cognitive scale, which in a primary care doctor's 15-minute uh, visit is, is less likely to be deployed, um, a neurologic exam uh, that has variable um, diagnostic uh, predictive power, depending on who's doing it, uh, to look for focal neurologic deficits, like you might find in the case of a stroke or uh, with cognitive decline due to a mass lesion in the brain, a review of the patient's medications to determine if there's any medical causes for dementia, lab studies which are typically not helpful, consideration for a head CT or brain MRI in clinic if they show some focal neurologic deficit, and consideration for formal neuropsychological testing depending on your access to this kind of testing. So how does FDG-PET enhance our clinical diagnostic acumen for dementia? So this is an interesting study um, that looked at six neurologists who are um, self-professed uh, self dementia experts uh, and who have at least 10 years of uh, clinical expertise at NIA-funded Alzheimer's disease research centers. They were asked to evaluate 45 real-life clinical scenarios in patients, all of whom had undergone autopsy at death to determine the final gold standard for diagnosis. 14 of these individuals had frontotemporal dementia, and 31 had Alzheimer's dementia. And what they found was that when these six experienced clinical neurologists uh, put their heads together with the clinical scenario and clinical information, their diagnostic accuracy was about 78%. Um, they were given a symptom checklist that was supposed to be useful in differentiating these two disorders uh, with 26 questions. It, it hit about the same level. Scenario plus the checklist was, again, a little below 80%. When they weren't given the clinical scenario at all, when they were just given PET uh, results, just the transaxial FTG PETs, uh, they had about a 5% bump in diagnostic accuracy. And when they were given the stereotactic service projections of the FTG PET, they were at near 90% accuracy without any clinical information. Uh, so these are, this is just a picture showing what images they were shown. And this is the same study uh, with an interesting uh, table over here. So this is actually a measurement of the physician's certainty or physician confidence amongst these, uh, in these neurologists who are accustomed to seeing patients with dementias when given either the clinical scenario or when given the stereotactic surface pro um, projections. And it's, it's kind of a busy figure, but it's also kind of interesting. So, so these are 31 patients, all of whom have pathology-confirmed Alzheimer's disease, so 31 rows. There are six hash marks here on each side of this midline that represent the six physicians, uh, and they're, they're color-coded. And if, I don't know if you can see down here, but if the physician got the correct diagnosis and they were very confident, they have a brighter color of red. If they got the incorrect diagnosis, they have a brighter color of blue, depending on how confident they were in their incorrect diagnosis. And what you can see is that um, not only was confidence increased when given the PET alone, but also so was diagnostic accuracy, with 30 out of 31 individuals being correctly identified as having the specific neurodegenerative subtype that, that they were shown to have on autopsy. This is a less robust in the, in the subset of individuals with frontotemporal dementia, but is no less true over here, where 8 out of 14 individuals were correctly identified as having frontotemporal dementia using PET. Um, and you can see that some of these individuals were extremely, it looks like there was a 6 out of 6 here for very confident amongst all six physicians who were all very confident and wrong in this, in this particular individual.
So FTG PET is approved for this specific indication, but it's possible it might have much greater utility than, than just differentiating these two dementing disorders. It might be useful in, in differentiating a variety of dementing disorders that uh, outside of frontotemporal dementia, including dementia with Lewy bodies, which, has, which is common and has characteristic uh, uh, a distribution of FTG PET abnormalities. Uh, and that actually has the potential to have even greater impact on clinical management since patients with DLB are more medication sensitive and have the potential to benefit from low doses of dopaminergic medications for motor Parkinsonism. FDG PET may also be useful in differentiating um, less common atypical Parkinsonian conditions from AD and PD. That has the same sort of feedback on patient care management when it comes to the use of dopaminergic medications. But what this would really do, if this were the case, is these are very rare disorders and the, the struggle to try to develop treatments for these disorders uh, a huge bottleneck is identifying good candidates for clinical trials using some sort of objective standardized measurement. What this would do is it would facilitate clinical trials of these disorders, um, which would uh, be huge for patients who have these atypical Parkinsonian disorders. So the last uh, topic I'm going to address is, is amyloid PET, and I want to provide some background for this as well. So, I mean, the first statement I'll say is that Alzheimer's disease, especially in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease, can be incredibly challenging to make the diagnosis clinically. A lot of the patients that I see in clinic have been seen by a half dozen physicians before they even reach my office, and that often reflects the fact that they're older and have more severe cognitive symptoms by the time they, they come to our office. The real challenge for our field is identifying patients with early Alzheimer's disease because this subset of patients would be the most uh, likely to benefit from experimental therapeutics that, that will come, to, come, come into the field in the next generation. The gold standard for diagnosing AD is not something we do clinically, it's, it's autopsy. And, and what we find on autopsy is amyloid plaques in the neocortex uh, and neurofibrillary tangles in the, in, in the hippocampus. So this is a, this is a one slide overview of the history of amyloid PET. Um, the first amyloid PET tracer was developed by Mathis and Klunk at University of Pittsburgh through a modification of thioflavin T, which is a dye used to mark amyloid on post-mortem samples. Uh, around the same time, they conducted their first clinical trials in Sweden and a few years later published their results. Uh, Pittsburgh Compound B, or PIB, was adopted by a number of academic medical centers. And this was really, you know, this is less than 10 years ago, has led to a complete revolution in how we think about the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease, this huge public health problem. In April of, oh, in, in 2008, the first fluorinated ligand for amyloid was, was developed. And in April of 2012, the FDA approved AMVID, or fluorbetapyr, uh, for this particular indication. FDA approval is good, um, but if you want the technology to be used, CMS approval or Centers for Medicaid Services, uh, Medicaid and Medicare Services uh, is the real approval you need in order to see that the test is paid for. Uh, as of July of this year, they stated that the evidence is insufficient to conclude that amyloid imaging improves public health outcomes, and so it's not reimbursed uh, as of three months ago. It wasn't reimbursed prior to that, but it's, it's, it's more permanently not reimbursed now. So these are just pictures of, of PET ligands. You can see uh, Pittsburgh Compound B, thioflavin T, and the four uh, F18 ligands shown below. This is a picture of the appearance of F18 PET. And uh, fluorbeta pier has been the most tested of these F18 uh, amyloid ligands. And it's been validated against our gold standard post-mortem uh, studies in a very interesting paper. This uh, this study looked at 29 individuals who were, at, who were elderly and thereby at risk for cognitive decline, all of whom were in hospice and were expected to survive less than six months, uh, and all of whom consented to autopsy uh, after, after they passed away. They underwent PET imaging and, six, and within six months also went, underwent autopsy. And what the investigators found is that there was good correlation both in terms of distribution and quantity of beta amyloid between the PET assessment and the postmortem assessment. Uh, they also imaged 74 younger individuals who they expected to be normal when it comes to um, beta amyloid distribution, and they found that that was the case, suggesting that there would be a low false positive rate for beta amyloid deficit, or for floor beta pier PET. So this kind of um, excitement has already crept into the, into the clinical realm, where in 2011, in advance of that paper, uh, the... Uh, Alzheimer's Disease Society of America revised their clinical diagnostic criteria for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, 
And most people that we meet clinically fit into two categories, probable or possible. To be more definite, you need actual tissue, tissue diagnosis, which, as you can imagine, is not something that's commonly pursued. Uh, but uh, this, this confusing set of guidelines was aimed at integrating A-beta PET or CSF studies and other functional imaging studies into coming up with a diagnosis of probable AD or possible AD. So new criteria involving A-beta PET were also developed for mild cognitive impairment and for a research diagnosis of preclinical Alzheimer's disease. This is an example of, uh, of um, the holy grail or, or of what we really hope to use amyloid PET and this, this era of biomarkers for. This is an isolated example, so this is not a, an example of a systemic phenomenon. But uh, this was a trial of a, an experimental drug called bapanuzumab that binds, it's a monoclonal antibody that binds against A-beta-42. Uh, and in a subset of individuals, the, all, the big picture trial failed to meet their primary endpoint. This subset of the trial used PIB-PET imaging as a surrogate outcome marker. So this, this uh, chart shows 20 patients who are random, with mild Alzheimer's disease who were randomized to either bapanuzumab and then I think nine patients who were randomized to placebo who underwent PIB PET imaging at baseline, week 20, week 45, and week 78. And you can see a really nice separation of these two curves with uh, less amyloid deposition and maybe even some resolution of, of amyloid with this experimental medication. So the real problem comes into play here. And so, so uh, the first PIB studies were published in 2004. And we've learned a lot about the pathogenesis and the relationship between amyloid deposition and Alzheimer's disease in the time since. And what we've found is, is, is a few different hypothesized models for, for the temporal lag between the development of these uh, clinical symptoms and of, of imaging phenomenon. And what appears to happen is, is that in a pre-symptomatic stage, individuals will develop a rapid rise in amyloid PET deposition, and then a relative plateau that will follow afterwards. These EMCI and LMCI stand for early mild cognitive impairment and late mild cognitive impairment that are thought to be antecedent states that precede dementia. And what you see here is that other biomarkers uh, lag behind the early deposition of amyloid significantly, uh, and that finally cognitive performance and then functional decline follow last. So this is one hypothesized model that uses these particular slopes another hypothesized model that more or less gets at a similar uh, uh, goal. Uh, it uses time here in the axis rather than disability. And here they suggest, um, this was a study done in Australia looking at the natural history of amyloid deposition in, in individuals over the age of 45. And they found surprisingly that amyloid deposition appears to precede clinical symptoms of dementia by anywhere from 12 to 20 years, an enormous lag time uh, for individuals who, who would otherwise not have any uh, overt cognitive decline. So uh, amyloid pathology is not only common in dementing disorders, but it appears to be common uh, in older individuals who, who progress to autopsy as well. There are a variety of studies that provide a variety of numbers. I've kind of picked a midpoint of 33% here. Um, but older individuals, uh, healthy elderly without any cognitive complaints, uh, will show AD levels of amyloid pathology on postmortem exam roughly 33%. Uh, um, what's more certain about amyloid pathology is that it's very uh, necessary for the development of Alzheimer's disease. So greater than 95% of those with clinical Alzheimer's disease who go to autopsy will have amyloid pathology. Um, this antecedent state of amnestic mild cognitive impairment is enriched for amyloid pathology. And uh, recent uh, PIB studies suggest that anywhere from 10 to 20% of cognitively normal individuals will show amyloid level uh, binding of PIB uh, in individuals over the age of 70. So two questions come up about the clinical utility of, of amyloid imaging. One is its discriminatory power and the other is its predictive power because these would be the real two clinical questions we would hope that this test would help us to answer. So uh, Camus et al. used floor beta peer to study 46 elderly subjects at risk for cognitive decline. They picked 21 individuals who were elderly but who didn't have cognitive symptoms. 12 with mild cognitive impairment, and 13 with Alzheimer's disease. They didn't use um, post-mortem evaluation, but they used as their gold standard an operative uh, standard of multi-domain neuropsychological clinical evaluations. 
And what they found was excellent sensitivity for detecting Alzheimer's disease using fluor beta pier and ex excellent specificity for differentiating Alzheimer's disease from uh, mild cognitive impairment and normal controls. And that was a cross-sectional study, a separate uh, longitudinal study by Dorswamy looked at 51 individuals with mild cognitive impairment at baseline, and they all went, underwent fluor beta pier imaging at baseline, and then again a year and a half later. And what he found was those individuals with mild cognitive impairment at baseline uh, and positive fluor beta pier scans seem to progress to Alzheimer's disease at three times the rate of individuals who had mild cognitive impairment but negative fluor beta pier scans at baseline. So these are, um, these are impressive numbers, but uh, when we take a step back and put them in a broader clinical context, it becomes very difficult to know what to do with them. Um, so sensitivity and specificity are useful numbers, but from a clinical perspective, the more useful numbers are what we call negative predictive value and positive predictive value, which incorporate an element of disease prevalence into, into these calculations. And what this basically means is, is if you're seeing a patient and you have the question, does this person have Alzheimer's disease or not, and you order this test, um, how positive will you be that this person has Alzheimer's disease after the test comes back? That's the positive predictive value. Or if the test comes back negative, how certain can you be that the person does not have Alzheimer's disease? And that's really the reason we would order this test, and that's, those are the values we need. And what you can see is that the negative predictive value is excellent. A negative uh, uh, amyloid PET scan in, in the appropriate clinical context has excellent uh, clinical utility. We could say with great confidence that somebody does not appear to have Alzheimer's disease um, if the test comes back negative. A positive test you know, is, is very different. It, it has a 56% positive predictive value in the appropriate clinical context where you're trying to parse, does this person have mild cognitive symptoms or is it really Alzheimer's disease? And, and these, were, uh, these were values that were reviewed by Centers for Medicare Services. Uh, and what they, what they determined is, A, since there's no treatment for Alzheimer's disease currently, no meaningful disease-modifying treatment, we don't think we're running the risk of depriving people of this treatment by not approving this technology. And the other thing they said is, is it useful for an individual to learn that we're 56% positive that they have Alzheimer's disease? I mean, if I was that individual, it would not be useful for me. Um, and the question is, does it improve health outcomes? And health outcomes can be whatever you want. Does it improve quality of life? Does it improve longevity? Does it improve uh, hospitalization rate or caregiver burden? And the thought was that there's insufficient evidence to suggest that it currently does. And this 29 versus 10% chance thing was interesting as well. Um, because when I think about this, I think, you know, Will individuals who are told they have a 29% chance of developing Alzheimer's disease in the next 18 months behave or plan or use medical resources differently than individuals who are told they have a 10% chance? And I think the answer to that question is no, or at the very least, we don't have any information to suggest that they would behave differently. Um, and so I think that these were the factors that went into CMS's decision. And actually, this degree of um, ambiguity or, or of amb ambivalence or, or mixed opinions is shared by Alzheimer's disease researchers across the field. So this was a survey done of ADNI, so Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging investigators, uh, neuroimaging initiative investigators. It was done two weeks before the FDA approval of fluor beta pier. They had a 52% response rate. And what they found was that, the, uh, was that it was about 50% of ADNI researchers who felt that it was appropriate to disclose the results of amyloid imaging to individuals who were participating in ADNI who had normal cognition. This number jumped to about three quarters here when we were talking about individuals who had any cognitive complaint. But I think that this number to me reflects uh, the fact that there's mixed opinion amongst uh, um, Alzheimer's researchers on what to do with this information and how much of it uh, we should factor into uh, patient advice, particularly as there's no clear treatment for, uh, for Alzheimer's disease at this point. And you can see here about a quarter of individuals definitely or probably do not support uh, disclosing this information to, to individuals with normal cognition. The same study tried to parse uh, the particular um, opinions of physicians with direct patient contact, so there were 62 of them, uh, and they grouped their, their thoughts on the utility of a variety of diagnostic testing for patients with normal cognition, with mild cognitive impairment, and with Alzheimer's dementia. And what they found was that investigators felt that amyloid PET had the most utility when employed in this particular setting. Individuals who have cognitive symptoms who are at risk for dementia but don't yet have, have dementia. And that's interesting um, because my take on, on this is that um, given the limited positive predictive value of, of this test, 
I think it is probably better employed in this, in this column over here um, to help efficiently and effectively rule out a neurodegenerative illness in people who have more severe or more profound cognitive impairment. So this was the exact, this was the quote from the CMS um, bulletin. So it says, the evidence is insufficient to conclude that the use of amyloid beta PET imaging improves health outcomes for Medicare beneficiaries with dementia or neurodegenerative diseases. It's interesting to note that they don't say at risk for that. They say patients who actually have dementia. Uh, they do go on to do a little hemming and hawing here about uh, something they think, you know, but this test could be useful in differentiating uh, rare disorders like AD versus frontotemporal dementia in the same way FDG PET is used. And here, to enrich clinical trials um, by allowing selection of patients on the basis of biological, i.e. the presence of amyloid, uh, as well as clinical and epidemiological factors. This latter part, I'm yet to, you know, it's only, it's only been a few months, but I, it's not clear to me how this will be employed in clinical practices. You need to have funding for a huge clinical trial uh, anyway. Um, all right, so my conclusions about amyloid is that, um, is that it will continue to be used as a biomarker in AD clinical trials. Uh, and it's an exciting biomarker. It, it actually might be closer to achieving a clinically ready indication, not as a surrogate marker of disease progression, but as a categorical yes, no, you have Alzheimer's disease, you don't have Alzheimer's disease type, type uh, marker. And I think that, um, I think that that's going to be a richer use of, of this particular thing, particularly given the increased prevalence of Alzheimer's disease that, that's expected over the coming generation. So a negative amyloid PET scan may have greater utility than a positive result and that we need more studies to explore the natural history of, of what happens to individuals who have negative PET scans, if this is a, truly an indication where we're hoping to get this test approved. So in summary, big picture summary, so uh, uh, presynaptic dopamine terminal imaging is very useful at differentiating Parkinsonian conditions from other types of tremor. FDG PET imaging all, is already superior to our clinical diagnostic acumen in differentiating Alzheimer's disease from frontotemporal dementia and may have many much greater utility that's so far unexplored or unreimbursed. Uh, and amyloid imaging shows great utility in research, uh, has taught us a lot about the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease in less than 10 years, uh, and has great potential to help us distinguish patients who have or don't have Alzheimer's disease and also has enormous potential to enrich clinical trial participants going forward. And uh, that's it for me. Uh, uh, any questions?